Welcome back to the Skate Room Podcast, where we chat art and skate in the name of social change. Today, we're joined by Nesta Judkins, a professional skateboarder, photographer, traveler, and founder of Salad Days of Skateboarding, an NGO which empowers budding skateboarding communities around the world. The Skate Room, alongside artist Henry Taylor, is sponsoring Salad Days' build of the first skate park in Pakistan. But before we get onto that, Nesta, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Cool. Um, so generally speaking, as I kind of explained to you, the social projects we speak to and support, uh, the founders, generally speaking, they haven't had a decade of professional skateboarding behind them. Do you know what I mean? They've kind of come in from perhaps a different angle into the uh, skate NGO, social skate side of things. But you've really come from a long career as a well-known professional skateboarder. Um, can you give us a little bit of a background info on like who you are for those of our listeners who don't who don't know and maybe how you came to let's say transition into this area of uh, of the industry? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I've yeah, I've been fortunate to have had a long skateboarding career, um, longer than I would have expected. I think so. I've been skating most pretty much my whole life. Um, I grew up in an area in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area in California, at a time when there was a really big skate scene where I grew up called the Tilt Mode Army. And I was just the local kid at the skate shop and, you know, skating in the parking lot and just got connected to these top pros that I looked up to a lot and got to go skating with them. And from there, it just kind of snowballed and I ended up getting sponsored and at a pretty young age and and yeah I've, I've been just skating ever since been living in that sponsored skateboarding world which um yeah i rode for santa cruz skateboards when i was 16 and then a few years later i got on enjoy which is was the local was um which is a big skate company and was my favorite skate company at the time but it was also the whole team was was local San Jose skaters for the most part and people I had known for years already. So yeah, I just fell in with them and then I still ride for Enjoy 15 years later, um, still doing the same thing. Up until starting Salad Days, I was pretty much doing the same thing of filming video parts, shooting photos for magazines, you know, being the one on the, being the one documented skateboarding on that side of skateboarding. And then uh, in the last few years, I've kind of naturally, also naturally evolved into getting more interested in, you know, devoting the resources I had as a professional skateboarder and the connections I have as a professional skateboarder to, to kind of like spread the, uh, the access of skateboarding to, to places where I've encountered where skateboarding exists, but they don't have resources, you know? So like, this is an interesting thing from, from my side as someone who grew up skateboarding and was attracted to Enjoy as a company because of its sort of, it's serious skateboarding skill-wise, but it's not serious skateboarding image-wise to a degree. Do you know what I mean? And I'm wondering whether that's informed, you know, growing up in that crew with those influences, you know, do you think that do you see a line through that as to the, what dra what maybe drew you into this other side of, of skateboarding or is there something there, you know? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, um, it's a personality thing. Like my personality really fits well with Enjoy as the brand. And Enjoy came about in 2000 when skateboarding was very serious. It was like these epic skate videos, like very serious skating and, and Enjoy came out as the antithesis of that. And it came out naturally as well. It wasn't forced, it just happened. It had, there was like Mark Johnson, who was a well-renowned pro at the time. He was in that world of like filming video parts and like he had lived in Southern California where the main skateboarding industry was based at the time. And he moved back up to San Jose just to be with his friends and just skate and have fun. and enjoy just naturally happened at that time. And I, I find that to be kind of like, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of how my life has evolved too. Like things naturally happen and they come for a reason. Enjoy came for a reason at a time when skateboarding was so serious 
and it just they're like you know what skateboarding is fun why everyone has fun skateboarding even these pros who are taking it seriously why can't we just represent what we love about skateboarding in a in a company and in the videos we make and yeah when they came out at that time like it changed the whole industry everyone recognized that wow these guys like there was all these articles coming out about like the company that's having fun and that was tilt mode which was the crew which enjoy came out of the crew um and it was like a weird thing for everyone to recognize that that like something made such a big splash because it represented the fun of skateboarding where that is really the whole point of the whole thing and to this day like if i'm not having fun with it it doesn't make sense I don't know. It's, it's it should be about fun, and that's kind of also the goal, uh, the, the whole ethos of like all these social skate programs is to allow fun into the lives of people who you know live in different circumstances and don't have space to play. Mm. Even even from like just you know totally being in and around London where skateboarding was very accessible and particularly to someone of my identity, it's like it wasn't tough, but even for me enjoy felt more accessible as a company do you know what i mean it felt like a company that i would like when you're a kid proud to like rep the panda you know what i mean or or to have those stickers or whatever and i remember that really clearly from bag of suck days which i know just just predates you joining the team i think right uh, mm -hmm. that, that video um but yeah and I, and i do i think that yeah that accessibility and it's funny you say that it warrants an, a kind of an article written about it that it represents accessibility and fun and the fun and joy of skateboarding but it feels like that to sort of draw a line to to today and to these uh social skate projects like the one like salad days that you've you founded it does feel like that conversation is being had again in a sort of on a global scale to some degree where skateboarding there is there is still a side of skateboarding until very very recently which is was confused at the idea of it being accessible to everyone or for the joy of it to be spread around to you know places all around the world where skateboarding perhaps hasn't been hasn't been seen you know um i'm wondering how do you how do you factor in travel and your experience of those cultures back then when you were traveling probably to shoot or demo or things like that how do you how how did you already kind of see sow the seeds of what would now become a, a a mission to kind of spread skateboarding around the world like what were you seeing in different trips and things that inspired you to do this yeah so i mean that, that was um to me always what i thought was the biggest the luckiest aspect of, of being a, a professional skateboarder was the ability to travel. Um, you know, and it, it's, we, I spent a majority of my life up until this point traveling nonstop for skating. And we got to go on a lot of tours with, with skate companies where we go to uh, more commonly visited places, you know, like in Europe or, or in Asia, um, where there was already big in infrastructure infrastructure for skateboarding you know and we do these like guided tours where it was always the same and i'm super grateful to have gone gone on them but you go and you film your tricks at the the skate spots to make a video and it always is very much like you're going there to do your work and then you leave um and then over the years i got in more you know in touch with other people who were who were doing the same type of skate trips but more Explored, uh, exploration version of it like jonathan Maring, who's a skate photographer who would do he would organize these tours for skateboarder magazine where they would go to india for example where at that time i went with him at that time in 2013 and there was no skateboarding in india it was a very small crew it was very there was nowhere to skate and um you know, it was like exploring. He'd go with like a group of pros and go to India, for example, and explore what you can find skateboarding there, you know? Like, see if you can find spots. And you make more of like a, a Nat Geo style skate article about it. And those got me, those trips got me more interested in that exploration into places where skateboarding didn't exist yet. 
because you can find skateboarding everywhere. You can find spots. And a lot of those places from those years on, skateboarding started to bud in those places. Like, for example, in India, they got their first skate park built that same year after we had visited. Uh, Make Life Skate Life, I believe, built the park. And that was one of the first times I had heard about these NGOs going around building parks in, in developing countries like this, where there wasn't really a strong skate scene to warrant a skate park, but they knew there was a few skaters. And if you plant the seed of a skate park, like it'll go from there. And if you look at India now, like if you look at India now, it's it's probably one of the best examples of of that seed being planted where they have like a whole distribution. They have their own skate park building company in India called 100 Ramps. And, you know, it's only 10 years, almost 10 years. And they've already like skateboarding has exploded there. So, yeah, I think, you know, it's just, like I said, natural progression. I got interested in traveling through skateboarding and taking advantage of that. And then I got introduced to people who led me to realize I could turn into more, you know, exploration traveling through skateboarding. And from going on those trips and just meeting skaters who didn't have places to skate or access to boards, it just led me, it just made sense, you know. I'm also going on these other trips with teams and seeing how much access we have to skateboards and seeing, you know, people set up new boards in front of the hotel and just leave a, a board on the sidewalk. And, you know, it made me think like, it's just that, you know, um, I want to say wastefulness, but just the imbalance of, of access and excess that some people have. Seems like you, like you were seeing, you were seeing something on the, on the one hand you were in, being injected by a huge amount of kind of opportunity and excitement by skateboarding and yet the more kind of as you say the more you traveled around and saw the more you saw was lacking in perhaps the more traditional side of it you know like this um excess or wasteful kind of vibe and i guess it's the case in any in any industry like this where sporting equipment you know it is effectively you know that's what it is is that like people want to be skating at their best and for a lot of people, that means they get used to skating fresh decks all the time. Um, do you, the more you got into this and the more people you say you met who could kind of, I don't know, draw draw that out of you, did you did you find that people were looking at you back then as like, oh, like Nesta's doing a lot of stuff in this direction, is this taking away from his, his skateboarding or was everyone just sort of supporting it? How was it internally in the skate industry at that time to, to think about doing this yeah so at that time there's a lot more balance um i had to be more conscious of you know you have duties as a, a professional skater and I, I like to say i'm lucky i've done it this long but i was always aware that i needed to be filming with the right filmers to get into the right videos that i was supposed to be working on you know so i would try to balance it like i said i would just i made the point of like okay i have this ability to travel i'm going to do a lot of these trips when i can but i'm not going to let them take away from trips with my sponsors you know like with a, an adidas trip if an you know even if one place one opportunity seemed a lot more interesting than the other i, I would obviously do my um, duties as a professional skater as well so um, where was i going to leave with that but Basically, yeah, I would do that at the time. So I would just, you know, I would, I would, I mean, I was always aware that skateboarding is a lucky thing to do for a living. So I'm going to use that, and which I still do now, to piggyback my ability to do these other trips. Because a lot of, a lot of people I know who started NGOs, um, you know, when I was seeing them at the early stages and these are these are people who kind of don't have that career in the skate industry before it was actually getting the attention of people in the skate industry to help them get boards or help them get some financing or whatever that was w proved very difficult at the beginning mm -hmm. um did you did you find i mean that must have given you kind of a give you a kind of a booster straight into it or or not really that's i'm kind of interesting i'm interested because now it seems like a lot more especially bigger uh, companies are super interested in at least telling these stories. And I wonder whether back then, you know, as you say, like the, the India uh, scene with 100 Ramps and, and the Holy Stoke crew and all of that lot, like that was a really still very early days 
example? Yeah. I think, um, I mean, I think my advantage as a being connected to the skate industry was I definitely had a lot of access to, to skate gear. Mm -hmm. But I would say that was basically the, the biggest difference. I mean, financial, as anyone running an NGO and what I learned right away, maybe I was naive before, but getting, you know, financial support is very difficult um, for, I would say, most NGOs that are starting grassroots like like we start, like Salad Day started. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was mostly my connection in the skate industry where a lot of people were generous. I, I mean, I started, and this was another thing where I, I was like, I hope this doesn't get me in trouble with my sponsors, but I, I, I started out by just mostly for the first few years just giving away most of my own stuff. Um, you know, as skateboarders, we get ten, a box of 10 boards and I don't need 10 boards. I don't, I always, it's my personality to use the board until it's done. I don't, you know, so I had excess boards of my own that I was giving away. And luckily the sponsors were supportive of that and kept saying that they like what I'm doing. So that didn't cause any problems. But, you know, as salad days grew into more of a thing that I want to be beyond me and, you know, I, I wanted to be able to get access to other, you know, boards from other companies, different sizes, for example, you know. So kids didn't have to ride the same small skateboard that I have. Um, so, are you worried your skateboard was too small for the kids? No, no, my my board's good for the kids. Okay, uh, <laughs> adults don't like it. It's it's trendy to ride like what an eight point five now, and I ride a seven point nine inch board, which is is like a nineties shape board. It's smaller, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I think yeah, I I, I guess. Maybe I had a, a leg up in attention because I, I could get, I could um, launch, try to launch this NGO from my skate career and the connections I already had. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just, it's just super interesting because, um, as, as I say, like, generally speaking, the vast majority of people who start these things aren't coming from, from that field. So I think it's, I think it's, it's intriguing to see somebody drop, not drop, because you, as you say, you're balancing and you still are, you know, a working professional skateboarder. Although I did hear you say in, on your Beyond Boards podcast that uh, that less than what you'd expect the uh, expectation would be to do that kind of thing from from back in the day. Um, do you do you also feel that therefore that the like the balance has shifted now and how do you how do you kind of if you could draw bullet points or headlines of the journey from having that first idea to start salad days to this skate pakistan build mm -hmm. um what are the kind of key points and how did that impact your how you balance your professional skateboarding career and your salad days work and who else is involved, actually? Because I, I can, I'm sure it's not just you alone. Yeah. So I'll start with who's involved. Um, so I started it in spring of 2020. Um, and quickly, you know, it was an idea that I started. And I quickly, within my personal connection of people that I've been volunteering with different skate NGOs in the past, we kind of came together to, to work on salad days. I got... Keegan Gazard, who who also does CSEF, which is the College Skateboarding Educational Foundation. Him and I, we met in Palestine a few years before volunteering for a skate camp out there called Skate Kilia. So he came on board and was like happy to help me and knew a lot more about nonprofit management than I did at the time, knowing absolutely nothing other than just having the idea. Um, and then Kenny Reed quickly came on board as well because him and I have had like a very similar trajectory. He was a, a professional skateboarder that I looked up to. Maybe we overlapped, but he would, I would say he was like 10 years before me in, in his career. And mm -hmm. also want, he went in the, the route and paved the way for a lot of people like me to see that you can take skateboarding and travel and do your own thing with it rather than just sitting around waiting for companies to send you somewhere that you have the ability to, to go and like to meet people and, you know, get your own, build your own relationships with skateboarders across the world. And he was also running the, the Skate Kilia camp in Palestine. So he came on board and he does a lot of skate camps now. 
um, in his post skateboarding career. He runs skate camp, so he he's really helpful with our workshops and a lot of the youth outreach that we do. So, and then my wife as well, who's a creative director, she helps with all designs and everything. So that's the whole crew right there. But I would say from starting it salad days in spring of 2020 and from up until that point, traveling nonstop for 15 years skateboarding to not traveling at all for two years and starting an NGO that is, to be honest, very travel-based, um, it changed everything. But it also helped me kind of fast forward to what is the goal of how to maintain this this NGO and like in the future, you know, when, when I'm not able to travel or, or, or a goal of how to like sustain skate communities without having to travel all the time to, to serve them. So it helped kickstart a lot of our research into what communities we want to support. And the first two that came up were Pakistan and Bhutan, just due to um, personal connections, I think. Um, and Pakistan proved to be exactly hit all the criteria of, of a place where skateboarders have no support um, and just, you know, like falls under this this general image in the West of a, a place that it's, it has a very bad, I would say, overall. Like, I don't know, the, the image of it, people aren't quite aware of what life is really like there. So I thought that for me personally, I was really what made me want to support them is is there's you know skateboarders who have no access no support and then the the world doesn't even know they exist and thinks you know like it's like anywhere there's there's normal people anywhere in the world and they so yeah so they fit our criteria of, you know like uh, a skate crew who wants to build up a bigger form of support build up their own scene they have boys girls skating together you know they're very inclusive and so we started conversating, you know, having conversations with them. We met the the right person there who became our local partner, Shaihan. And he worked, we worked together building up a whole format of, you know, how we could support them and how our support could lead them into building up their own scene. And we shipped initial boards out. He gave them to the right people. He held workshops on his own. And then finally, we, when travel became possible again for us in February, 2022, we went out there and we brought a bunch of boards. We brought DIY board press, we brought cameras, we brought like everything that we think a skate scene needs to, you know, really explode or whatever, um, to support not just the skaters, but the other people like skate adjacent people who might be more interested in documenting skateboarding or building skateboards. Um, so we went out there and did our initial support helped you know them like whatever we just met them and spent time together skating together building further building relationships and then yeah we got contacted by leo from wonders around the world about building a skate park and that wasn't something i, ne I initially intended to do i thought but then once that became kind of a something that seemed feasible it's just the next it's a natural progression you know it's they a place like Pakistan, like many places, skateboarding can hit, kind of hits a ceiling where, you know, no matter how many skateboards you inject into a place, you need space to do it. And those, it's a place that's so, I would say the streets are so condensed and chaotic that there's not many natural places to skate where a skate park would really benefit them. That's like, that seems like what they need to take it to the next level. Yeah, yeah. So just to, because we kind of jumped through the beginning of that, beginning for Pakistan coming onto your uh, radar at all to suddenly you're building a skate park. Um, the initial consideration of, of, of Pakistan, what, what was the kind of reality and what was what was the impact? Maybe, I don't know, are you able to break it down into maybe what you saw when you were there aside from just the... Um, the fact that obviously they need a space to do it. But I know that skate, skateboarding Pakistan are also planning on doing programming afterwards. Is that is that right? So can you maybe speak a little bit to either through your own experience or through what you what you you know about the scene, about how those 
the skate park plus the programming plus the boards that you're injecting impact the young people? Yeah. Um, so Skate Pakistan has plans. They're already doing workshops now with local youth, um, but they have plans once the skate park's built is to to make a more systematic programming. And um, we've been in talks with with Skatistan prior to this about perhaps getting some of their curriculum involved in in the the programming there. So it's it's more than just you know hanging out with a bunch of kids skating. It kind of like infuses some life lessons and and more educational aspects um, through the you know through the uh, connection of skateboarding or the introduction of skateboarding. So. Um, Sorry, I lost my thought, but I'll get it in a sec. Well, I can see, I can see, like, for example, I was chatting with um, some of the team earlier today and was talking about that it's 54% of the population or something is under 19. And mm. at the same time as that, it's got one of the world's highest rates of um, illiteracy. Yeah. Um, and so I suppose combining kind of the educational aspect of those programmings that Skate Stand do and that skate Pakistan can do also, plus the positive influence and resilience that like skateboarding programs bring to, to young people as we've seen around the world with all of these other projects. Um, I imagine that's probably one of the key the key um, benefits of those of those programs, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think Pakistan is just it's it's such a prime location for for this program the skateboarding educational social program you know like i think it's almost half of the kids are out of school um there's huge disparity in in economics socioeconomic backgrounds and you know the plan is to to hold these skateboarding workshops and you know be able to kind of through skateboarding open doors for a lot of the youth who, who un, like it's sadly just don't have anything else to do they don't have they don't have a chance to to learn they don't have a chance to be a kid they're like thrown into work right not thrown sorry their their life forces them into work and struggle right away mm -hmm. and we're using you know skateboarding as a fun tool and you know like everyone knows and it's not just anecdotal because um, Neftali Williams proved this at USC that you know skateboarding has a lot of social benefits. It teaches a lot of life lessons, and through these life lessons, you know, of community building, of resilience, determination, persistence, all these things. And then when you bring in a little bit of the skateboarding educational curriculum that Skateistan has paved the way for, it, it could really. I mean, I just I think it could really impact. A lot of these kids lives where if they don't have anything else to do it's like it's i don't know it's sad for me to think about that just to grow up without education or options you know what does that lead yeah well it's really exciting to see the project come on and it's really exciting for us um to be you know throwing our support your way and and toward the project as well and to be able to see you know it's such a big collaboration of of different uh parties as well because you've got uh wonders around the world skate pakistan you guys is there an is there another party as well involved no it's us three it was those three. three yeah um and wonders around the world obviously we've worked with a number of times before mm -hmm. and leo leo Poulet's absolute legend um so it's really really cool to see these these come together and i think it's uh 100 with the local knowledge with your your kind of power behind it and with the uh, wonders around the world's expertise in designing skate parks i think it's going to be a really exciting uh, thing that will as you say like once once you have a space once these once these places have a space you see the seeds of a scene planted and it grows in so many different ways and can have like in like as you mentioned with the india scene um build its own industry that can then build its own um 
well design and design and shape its own community as well which is yeah really cool to see um what's your um i wanted to i wanted to see if you if you th th there was a in the beyond boards podcast which um you're on there was a moment when you said that this is kind of your favorite period of your career i think you've said something along those lines not yeah putting, not putting words in your mouth but do you see yourself now like you know it's only two years into this really becoming a thing you know salad days uh, do you see this growing for you and do you and expanding expanding or you know where do you where do you see this going mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting to hear that um i i definitely believe that this is my favorite um point or whatever my favorite thing i've ever done through skateboarding um mm -hmm. it's been the most exciting it's taught me so much um yeah it's interesting that i said that in the beyond boards podcast because that we did that right when i started salad days in spring of 2020 and now yeah now two years in and having actually like especially this year been able to accomplish a lot of our actual goals this year mm. um yeah it's true i mean i think it's just it suits me and what i care about a lot more um you know i think I pers my personality i don't really like attention so much so being on the one being filmed that was always something that was kind of like difficult for me i had to feel really comfortable to to perform you know as a skateboarder so and this speaks a lot more to to you know like kind of an altruistic nature that i have of of wanting to you know share skateboarding like i don't feel good if i have everything and other people don't have it um i don't i don't know i, I it, it just it just suits me a lot more and i'm very yeah it's just been really fun just building this this ngo building salad days and like being able to collaborate with people that i and learn from people like people that i respect like the other board members and to have them on board and we're all building this thing together it's been fun i think so i don't know my hopes for it is that i just i want it to keep going and keep expanding to get more people involved you know build it's a very small ngo it's only four of us i want to build the board of directors um get a lot more opinions that that we don't exactly see all the time you know get a lot more diversity in our board of directors so and just continue reaching new communities um but not i want to i mean that's something i want to be careful of is is i want the communities we're working with now to to grow and get to a point where they're self-sustainable mm -hmm. at least as much as possible and then we can like expand into other communities and help build them to that same level yeah yeah you know you need you know, there has to be empowerment and ownership mm -hmm. of the community as well um and i think skateboarders but I mean, I don't, I don't know other other social impact spheres, but I'm sure these, I'm sure these other areas have made these mistakes and learned from them. I feel like skateboarding is sort of a, really unique in just how many projects. I mean, we're talking hundreds of projects around the world that are doing uh, either programs or building infrastructure whatever and one thing that seems to be as these project when these projects come together for something like the good push or something like or or pushing borders or something like this you have this share of knowledge and with this share of knowledge you see um lessons being learned you know we can't just build infrastructure and leave it we need to make sure that there's programming and local ownership and empowerment otherwise you know it either will be forgotten or it can actually become a negative space sometimes as well and I think that's like fascinating that we're all sort of learning how to do this together because well skateboarders or people within this sphere know the impact that skateboarding has had on their lives positively and you may not be able to convince a huge ngo a non-skate ngo to to support it right away until you've kind of made those made those mistakes and learned from them and figured out exactly what the uh 
the methodology and the approach is. And it's, it's so interesting just on a personal level to see the difference between 10 years ago, how this was being done to now and mm -hmm. what people start with already knowing. Do you know what I mean? It's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, I think it's just gonna expand from here. Like you said, it's, 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 it's a very DIY thing. Like people in this whole social skate programming is, is less than 10 years old or around 10 years old. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's expanded everywhere. And I agree with that. I've definitely, I'm like looking towards other NGOs to see what I, what I think works really well and trying to adopt a lot of those ideas into what salad days kind of projects into our um, communities that we work with, mm. you know, and it's always the same thing. It's, it's, you need, the most important thing is you need a really good, responsible, trusted local that you can work with who's willing to put in the same or more work on their part, you know, to keep it going and to, to, you know, make sure that it continues for their community. Um, and yeah, it's just so much more than just, just access to boards. You know, it's not like here's some free boards, you know, and just leave. It's, it's a yeah. sustained thing. You know, it's, Skateboards are just the beginning. Having access to skateboards is the beginning, but then what you do with those boards and, you know, how you approach, you know, kids or different communities with those boards. And yeah, it's, it's such a learning process. And I find that very interesting. And I definitely look towards a lot of the other social projects that are going around around the world for, for inspiration or ideas of, what works, what doesn't work, and each place needs to be tailored differently, you know, each location you work at. Mm -hmm. So it's it's yeah, I mean it's exciting. It's a lot of fun to 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 learn and collaborate with other programs or even just whether I know them or not, just to see what works, what they're doing. Um, yeah, yeah. It's um we've chatted a lot about our uh, about skate. We've chatted a lot about the social impact aspect of your work. I want to ask you a little bit about art because I know obviously you're a photographer. Um, I wonder, I've wondered on the lead up to this conversation, whether you would describe yourself as an artist or whether you really see this photography as something more documentary, but I'm interested where you feel like art fits into your, your life because it's a key part of what, you know, what we do. Yeah. Um, I think in my life, I've always enjoyed art. I've always, loved being around art even as a kid i used to draw all the time when i was a kid um and that kind of evolved into being interested in photography um as i grew up and got more interested in journalism and documentarian you know documentary mm -hmm. um so yeah i, I kind of enjoyed photography and learning about photography and you know as my life turned into this thing where I traveled and had all these opportunities to do that. I was always very aware and interested in documenting where I was and my experiences. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, it's just what I, it's something I, I care very deeply about, you know, it's, it's a personal thing. I'm not like, I don't know if I consider myself or if it's considered an artist or not, but it's, it's a personal project of mm -hmm. something that matters to me. And it's always mattered to me. And it's, you know whether i share the photos or not it's something that i'm very happy to have you know some record of of this life you know mm. there's a there's a lot of your photography that i've seen is travel based and is and is taken kind of i don't know if you describe it as as you, well you kind of said it kind of more of a more attracted to the sort of documentary side of photography street photography things like this mm -hmm. Is there a is there a church and state aspect about skate and photography? Did you ever try and get into real skate photography in the sense of that? Have you done that? No, yeah, I never tried to to shoot skate photos. Um, basically, I would say what 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 held me back from even approaching shooting skate photos is I've always shot film. I don't know anything about digital photography, and I never learned how to sync flashes basically <laughs> so those two things are going to hold you back from shooting yeah, a good photo. Sure. 
um, yeah, I'm just, it's, it's just more like, it's just more an expressive thing, um, you know, and I think skateboarding is an expressive thing. And I think photography for me became my form of expression um, mm -hmm. more than, you know, our traditional drawing and stuff, which I used to be more into when I was younger. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I have shot a few skate photos. I do shoot them for fun, but I also like to do, most of my photography is very candid. I like candid photography. So I've never, unless like I was able to like candidly shoot a skate photo, I've never been like, oh, can you do that again? Which is what a skate photographer has to do. They have to mm -hmm. coordinate the, the photo with the skater. I've always just liked to just, you know, be on the sidelines and just document my surroundings. Yeah, yeah. I've gotten a few good skate, skate, some good skate photos that I'm pretty stoked on randomly. Um, so, yeah. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I suppose there's a point in which um yeah you you enter in, you enter into a as you say there's something more candid and spontaneous about analog not knowing what you've just shot really i mean you know but you don't know until it's developed what it what it's really going to be and yeah i guess you you're capturing a place a lot of the time it seems to me like when you when you're doing these a lot of these um a lot of the series the stuff you've sent over which uh, which relates to the Pakistan mm -hmm. um, scene and that trip. It's really, a, it's, there's some really great, uh, you capture a mood very well, I see. Ooh, thank very, you. Yeah, it's very nice to see. Um, I, I kind of reached the end of my line of questioning, that's that you can relax. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I'm wondering whether there's something it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a um, crude question, maybe. But is there a, is there a kind of key lesson that you've learned, or or a similar or a lesson that mm, maybe a kind of something that guy has guided you through both your skate and now your social skate um, kind of careers? Is there is there a kind of key lesson that's to do with skateboarding or to do with this this toy or this this exercise that you you keep coming back to. Um, there's a quote from Oliver Perkovich, which I remember years and years and years ago, he said, um, and he said, everyone falls off a skateboard the same way, mm. which is a really nice one. Do you know what I mean? That's one that I come back to again and again and again, because it mm -hmm. captures so much of this. And I wonder whether there's a sort of lesson or something that you hold on to that, that keeps you going through this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that speaks a lot to humility. And I think, um, I think, I mean, I don't hold on to it. It's just who I am. I, I feel it's just humbled all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. I think um, even, like I say, the luck that I had as a pro skater, I'm still humbled by it. I've always been humbled by it. And I've always known that it could end at any moment. And at the end of the day, it will end at a young age, relatively. That's the way the arc of skateboarding careers are. So. At the end of the day, I mean, yeah, just to, to enjoy what skateboarding lets offers, you know, what skateboarding really connects us to. And, you know, it's something that is a lifestyle more than anything, you know, whether you have this charm skate life or not, like skateboarding has built, you know, it's, it's the... It led me to a community of, of like-minded people who I've learned a lot from. It's exposed me to, skateboarding exposes you to all sorts of different backgrounds, whether that's through traveling to distant parts of the world or just, you know, living in a city like Los Angeles. Skateboarding can connect you with people you never would have met before. And I think that's the biggest lesson and that's what has inspired me to you know, besides just the self-expression of skateboarding. So I, it, it, it hits a lot of important aspects for me. It's, you know, the self-expression, but then also the people you meet and the road that it takes you down. And I think that quote you said by Oliver is really great where, yeah, we all fall up the, up the same way, you know? Yeah. It's, you, you meet people, all people, and you learn different backgrounds, you learn different walks of life, you learn different points of view. Um, 
because essentially we're just even now like i'm an adult and i'm just playing in a parking lot with my friends <laughs> which is yeah. pretty insane that you know it's 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 i think it's a beautiful life um it's more than just a sport it's more than just this like wooden thing that i don't know it, it, you gotta experience it to really know the, the value of skateboarding and i just appreciate it i appreciate everything and everyone i've met through it and i think that's what inspires me to like want to give places that don't that need a push you know that need this initial support but mm -hmm. they have the same feelings for skateboarding that i do so i that's that's what inspires me to fly across the world with four duffel bags full of skateboards to <laughs> meet my friend you know in, in lahore and just because I know he gets the same feeling from skateboarding and he's going to impart that to a whole new generation of kids who need it more than others, you know, so. Awesome, man. Well, I can't wait. And the skate room are super excited to see this skate park come to life and the and the scene to to build itself up. And yeah, as I say, we're super thankful to you for joining us on this, for this conversation, but also on as part of this mission for us to be able to to give to this project and to work with the artist Henry Taylor and and in association with Mocha for the um to raise that support. So yeah man, thank you so much for everything and just super stoked to see how it develops. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I'm I can't believe it. I'm really appreciate the skate room for this help, this support and just this platform to be kind of elevated. I don't know, to see Salad Days on the same list of NGOs that really inspire me, that I consider to be like top tier. It's it's pretty, I mean, oh, yeah, it's overwhelming to me uh, to to have this support. So it's going to happen with, with, with this support from the skate room, the skate park is going to take, take shape. Yeah, stoked. Hopefully we can come visit. Yeah, yeah, I want to have a, a opening ceremony. I want to try to see if I can invite more skaters to come and more people from all you know aspects to come for the opening skate the skate park the first skate park 